Good morning and welcome to your online digital worship for Trinity United Church of Christ in Canton, Ohio for Sunday, October 17th, 2021. This Sunday, it's our second Sunday back in the newly cleaned and beautiful sanctuary in our newly renovated building. If you are unwilling or uncomfortable or aren't able to come into the worship in the sanctuary, we're going to continue to provide online worship videos for the foreseeable future. Welcome, 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 wherever you may find yourself. We have a couple of announcements this morning. The first is that we do have a name for our new cafe. By a vote of those who are present on the 26th of September, we've gone with the Faithful Blend Cafe. We are going to have a new sign announcing that soon, but we all are welcome to the Faithful Blend Cafe, which will be open from 8.45 in the morning till 10 o'clock before church worship and during the early Sunday school classes and from 11 till 12 afterwards. So we invite you to come, grab a pastry, get some coffee, enjoy our new wonderfully renovated and beautiful space. We have the Hope Homes offering is still available. We collected this in honor of Reverend Dr. Paul Kiewit last week. And we still have some more envelopes. If you didn't get a chance to get one, you can come down to the church and pick one up or drop off a check with the Hope Homes written on it to our church main building in the office. And we will add that all to our large offering we're donating to them in honor of Reverend Kiewit. We want to say a special thank you to all of those who brought their pets to the Pet Blessing on October 3rd. We blessed about 20 animals in person. We had 25 animals that we honored who have passed on. And 25 more animals that were unable to be there, we blessed their pictures and their spirits. So that was a wonderful success. We're going to try to make this a yearly tradition. So next year on the first Sunday of October, we'll do it again. I want to let everyone know that our choir and our bell choir are going to start having rehearsals again. Our music director, Anthony Montano, is going to Start that up again on October 21st, this coming Thursday. So please, if you have done this before or you want to start new and you want to be involved in any of our music groups, please come on down to the church at 6.30 for the bells and 7.45 for the Sanctuary Choir. It'll be in the music wing, the also newly renovated and beautifully looking music wing. So come on down to that space, check it out, and join your voices or your bells into our worship experience. All are welcome. The Trinity Arts Show will also be next Sunday, the 24th of October. If you're interested in displaying some of your works, please see Irene Rodriguez. Now with all of that going on in this busy fall as we return to semi-normal, let us now join our hearts, minds, and souls to our spirit of worship. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for this time together while we may still be apart. May your word be a guiding post for our lives. May your spirit fill us to the brim with love, with joy, with grace. May we truly take your call to be your disciples, your people, your followers to heart. May we be the hands and feet of Christ to all those that we meet. May we lift you up in this hour of worship together. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Here with me now our call to worship. We may come here for a glimpse of glory, but Jesus asks us, can you drink the cup that I drink? The cup of Jesus' own life, struggle and joy, suffering and hope, the cup of the fullness of life. We may come here to get close to Jesus, and Jesus asks us, can you be baptized with my baptism? baptized into the reign of God where the Spirit breaks down barriers among all people and creates new relationships. We may come here for honor or fame, but Jesus challenges us to become great you must serve. Why are we here? To drink the cup of the fullness of life, to immerse ourselves in Jesus' struggle for justice and peace, to learn how to serve so that the world may be healed. This morning we have a prayer of adoration. Holy God, your tent is wide enough to provide shelter for all who seek you, food for all who hunger, 
and healing for all who suffer. Meet us here today and fill us with confidence in your presence that we may risk sharing Jesus' cup and his baptism so the world may become the place of love and justice you desire for all. Shelter us with your light and clothe us with your heavenly garments. Teach us how we may best serve ourselves and one another on this daring adventure. We give you thanks for all the blessings in our lives this morning. We pray these things in your name. Amen. The scripture this morning comes from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What is it that you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. And then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great amongst you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In 1888, the famous author and playwright, Oscar Wilde, wrote a story called The Selfish Giant. It's a wonderful allegory. It's a great children's story and an overtly Christian parable on morality. In it, a giant who owns a beautiful garden goes away on a trip for seven years. While he is gone, the neighborhood children go and play in the garden. They love this space. It's their favorite place to play. They all find refuge, safety, joy, and laughter in that giant's garden. But when he comes back after a seven-year trip, the giant gets angry with the kids and says, this garden is mine. Get out. He kicks them all out. He builds a massive stone wall around it. And he claims, this garden is mine and mine alone. He is incredibly selfish with the beautiful piece of land that he has. Soon it becomes winter. And as the snow falls and the trees are bare all around, the kids dejectedly play in the streets, which is not safe. They dejectedly walk around and around the walls of the garden, but they can't get in. The giant feels smug and pretty happy with having his place to himself, with hoarding the riches that God has provided just for him. But when spring comes, spring comes to the land all around except for the garden. The giant's garden remains bare and covered with snow. The giant is perplexed by this. He can't understand what has happened, but he sits alone and dejected in his barren garden. Then one day, he discovers somehow that a little boy has snuck into the garden and he wants to get up and climb in the tree. But he can't get there and he is crying and he is sad and the giant, perplexed at how this kid got in there, but also feeling compassion after all this time of loneliness, after missing season after season of the spring and the summer, sitting in perpetual winter for years, decides, okay, maybe it's okay that this kid is here, and he helps the kid up and places the poor crying child in the tree where he wanted to go. Time goes on, and then 
spring returns. The little boy thanks the giant, and he's so pleased that he got to go up in the tree, and that the giant showed compassion on him and shared his beautiful place, that he gives the giant a kiss on the cheek, and the giant's heart melts. He decides then that his garden is for all. He goes and tears down the wall, invites the neighborhood kids in, and for years after that, spring returns, and for years after that, the kids get to play in the garden while the giant sits and watches their joy. He gets joy by his generosity of his act. But the little boy never returns. He doesn't see the boy for years. As the giant gets older and comes towards the end of his life, suddenly he sees that little boy again. He's under the tree, but this time he has wounds on his hands and his feet. Symbols of nails on the cross. The giant gets mad and is enraged that someone would dare hurt this child, let alone his first and dearest friend. So the giant vows to strike the culprit down with a sword, but the child bids him peace. No, he says, these are wounds of love. At this moment, the giant realizes that this is no ordinary child. Who are you, he asks, reverently kneeling before the boy. The little boy does not answer the giant directly, however but rather says, let me play once more in your garden, and today you shall come with me to my garden, which is paradise. When the rest of the children visit the giant that afternoon, they find his body laying under the trees, covered in white blossoms. It's a beautiful story. The story can be used to connect to so many different scriptures. Clearly, the boy, obviously, represents Christ in the world a poor, helpless child that the giant helped. Whatever you have done for the least of these, you have done for me, says Jesus. There is redemption in this story for the giant who is so selfish at the beginning and suffers consequences, but then can change, open his heart, and become the kind of person, the kind of follower of Christ that we are all called to be. Generous, thoughtful, Loving and helping our neighbors, lifting a hand for the least, the lost, and the lonely. That's what happens to the giant. And Christ comes to him at the end of his life and takes him to paradise. But at the beginning, he is selfish with the things that he has. He wonders, what's in it for me? What about me? And that's where it comes to our scripture for today. When we look at the scripture for today, the part that we don't see is right before this passage, Jesus tells them of his impending death upon the cross, and suddenly James and John respond with, well, what's in it for me? What about me? We look at those disciples in this chapter. We look at the giant in the story and think, that couldn't be us. But haven't we all thought to ourselves, let me be selfish with the things I have. Let me hoard the good graces that God has given me. What's in it for me, even if you might be suffering? If we are honest with ourselves, do we spend more of our time looking for self-seeking benefits in our lives or ways to serve our neighbors? If we are honest, how many of us come to church and pray and invest in our faith lives because we hope there will be some sort of reward from God for our faithfulness? But do we spend more time asking the question, what's in it for me, than actually serving our neighbors? Do we spend more time in church and in prayer than we do actually feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, and offering shelter to the homeless? This morning, we're returning to the gospel scriptures, particularly the first gospel written, the gospel of Mark. We are picking up the story in the 10th chapter of Mark as Jesus is trying to explain to his disciples what will happen to him in Jerusalem at the cross. Jesus is wrapping up his ministry in Galilee at this point in the story and heading towards Jerusalem where he knows what will happen. And he wants to get his message across to his disciples before he gets there, but they don't get it. Time is running out and Jesus knows it. And he's trying to get his disciples to understand his mission and his purpose, but they don't get it. The mission and the purpose is heading towards that cross. For Mark's gospel message centers on the cross. 
Scholars have long considered Mark the gospel of the cross because other main topics are there, but the temple, discipleship, and all the moral teachings of Christ always come back to the reality of the cross as the grounding principle of the gospel. In the scripture for today, we hear a story about James and John, two of the very first disciples to follow Christ. These two have been with him during his entire public ministry. They have been listening to his teachings and telling the good news since the very first chapter of the Gospel of Mark. And yet, and yet, these two, James and John, are still struggling to understand the message that Christ has been trying to give them, as we see in this passage. Jesus shares a very tender moment with his disciples right before the scripture. He is vulnerable and he is raw. He tells his disciples that he is going to suffer and die. Can you imagine hearing from one of your closest friends that they are facing their own death? And then, as a first response, asking your friend if you can get in on their inheritance? Can you have their stuff when they're gone? That's essentially what James and John do here to Jesus. It's shocking, isn't it? After hearing that their dear friend, their mentor, their teacher is going to die, the first thing James and John do is say, can we get at the front row seats in the kingdom? Can we be at your left and right hand? Here in the Gospel of Mark, the shortest of all the Gospels, the first one written, the most rushed, most compact, most succinct Gospel, we see this pattern of Jesus predicting his death and the disciples not getting it and Jesus calling them out on it for the third time in chapter 10. The scripture today is the third time that Jesus shares with his disciples that he will suffer and sacrifice for them. And it is the third time the disciples completely misunderstand what he is saying. And for the third time, he tries to educate them about true discipleship. First, in chapter 8, Jesus cures a blind man at Bethsaida. And Peter praises Jesus for this. Then, Jesus tells Peter, that he will suffer on the cross in Jerusalem, and Peter does not understand and rebukes him. Peter rebukes Jesus. It doesn't go well. Then, in chapter 9, Jesus repeats his declaration that he will die in Jerusalem, and his disciples fall silent hearing this. And then they begin to argue about who is the greatest, because they are completely missing the point of Jesus' message. And now, for the third time in chapter 10, Jesus says once more that he is going to Jerusalem to die upon the cross. And again, the disciples don't get it. First, James and John ask for special places of honor, and then the rest of the disciples resent James and John for their self-interested pushiness and selfishness. Jesus' words still haven't sunk in and taken hold yet. So he says as plainly and clearly as possible, that to be great is to serve others. That to be the first is to be the last. That greatness comes from serving, not from being on top. Those dense disciples, we want to say, for the third time they have to be reminded that to be a disciple is to serve others, to be the last, to do good even when no one is watching, even for no hope of a reward. Those disciples had to be reminded again that their work is not about getting attention or praise, but instead changing the world through compassion, sacrifice, and service. For the third time, the disciples have to be reminded that honor, glory, and prestige for those who follow Christ are not measured, not measured in medals, titles, plaques, or power. For those who follow Christ, honor, glory, and prestige are measured in terms of service to others, self-sacrifice, and willingness to do whatever it takes to relieve the suffering of the poor, the sick, and the oppressed. We can easily point our fingers at James and John and roll our eyes at those silly disciples who still don't get it. Yet, yet, when we really deeply look inside ourselves, are we that different from those sons of Zebedee? Don't we all strive for recognition and honors? Don't we all want to know what's in it for us? What about me? 
What about me, Jesus? It is a part of human nature and celebrated in our modern society to want to get ahead, to want to be the best, to want to be honored and have your name up there in bright lights. Our society all around us focuses on glory and honor through power and domination, riches and rewards. Everywhere we look, from professional sports to academic institutions to Hollywood, we are told over and over again that the way to get ahead in this world is to have more stuff, to beat others for that promotion, to climb the corporate ladder, to win that next award, to be the greatest. Yet Jesus, Jesus turns all of this, all of these ideas of glory on its head. And he says to James and John, who are thinking the same way, oh, you think you want to sit on my left and right hand, huh? Well, you don't know what you're asking. You think you're asking for glory. <laughs> but on my left and right hand will be two crucified criminals suffering the same death that I will suffer. For the cup that I will drink will be sour wine on the cross. Ouch. This is what Jesus thinks of those who strive for glory and recognition the way our society teaches. Jesus responds to James and John with an ironic play on words, desperately trying to convince them that to be great, they must be willing to serve and sacrifice. Isn't this a lesson that we all need to hear over and over again? There are many Christians who believe that saving our souls and punching that ticket to heaven is our most important task. What about me? How do I get saved? However, for Jesus, for Jesus, the most important task is losing our lives in order to help others. Looking back to the final line of today's scripture, Mark 10, 45, Jesus reminds us that even the Messiah himself will be sacrificing for others. When he says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for the cause of many. Jesus is willing to lose his life in order to rescue ours. And this, my friends, is what true discipleship looks like. It is not a cautious path toward our own salvation while ignoring and stepping over the needs of others. It is not a hoarding of the resources and gifts that God gives us while locking others out and forcing them to play in the street in the snow, like the giant. Discipleship is a daring path toward alleviating the suffering of those around us. In fact, the great paradox of the Christian faith is that in losing our own life through sacrifice and service, we gain it in the kingdom of heaven. I believe that true discipleship is recognizing that Jesus is not our personal Messiah who goes to the cross so that we don't have to, but instead it is recognizing that Jesus is the one who calls us to follow him on his way to the cross. Mature Christianity requires us to move from a self-centered, safe approach to discipleship to a daring, self-giving approach to discipleship. For Jesus, the best seats in the house are not the luxury skyboxes or floor seats. They are the nosebleed seats way above the action on the field. According to Jesus, those who go to glory with him. Are those who sweep up the floor after the game? The honor and the glory go to the custodians cleaning out the toilets and making below minimum wage, not to the athletes making $10 million a year. Jesus reminds us in this passage that transformation happens through our servanthood. And just like the giant who was transformed when he stopped being selfish, when he wasn't looking for rewards, he did not know by helping that little kid and opening the garden back up again, that he was truly punching his ticket to heaven. He was not going for that reason. He was going to try to increase the joy and the beauty and the kindness around him. And that is the path we are called to follow. That is service to our neighbors. That is love of our neighbors. Following Jesus in a life of servanthood transforms us into those who have eternal life with him. Servanthood is a means to grace. When we serve others without the thought or hope for reward or recognition, our hearts are transformed like the giant and grace can enter into our lives. St. Francis of Assisi poetically described it this way. O divine master, grant 
that I may not seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. I will close with this question. Who will you serve? The voices of the culture that say you can be free, indeed must be free, on your own, at any cost to climb the ladder to get the best rewards, or will you serve the voice of Jesus that calls you to find your freedom and your true self through service to your neighbor? May we go and find true freedom through Christ by serving our neighbors. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May you go forth from this place remembering these words from Mark's Gospel. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. May you go and serve all with a humble heart and gladness.